How many, how many of you would agree with me this morning that God's ways are best? Amen. amen. Now, so let me thank you for the amens. Uh, let's raise your hand if you think God's ways are best. Now, it, it's not like I ask that question, someone's going to go, nah, I don't think so, here in church, I would hope, right? right. So, but for all, so for all of you that agreed that God's ways are best, how many of you agree that God's ways are best can also say, with me, knowing God's ways are best hasn't always meant I've chosen God's ways, instead I've chosen my own. Yeah, you know. So even though we would admit it, that God's way is best, sometimes, don't we, we choose our, we choose our way anyway. Call that sin, right? I guess that's when you choose to do what you want and not what God wants. That, you know. Because, but we know, don't we, there's a big difference between saying we know God's ways are best and actually doing God's ways. So that they play out, right? So most of us, if not all of us, I think we have good intentions, good intentions about serving God. But when it comes to sin and it comes to the, the, the subject of obedience, we also know good intentions don't cut it. Which prompted someone to say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I don't know who said it, but it's a... We're not unique in all of that. We're not unique, you know? So I, I want to look at someone today um, in the Bible who struggle with the same thing. I mean, there are, other there are other examples that we know of where we kind of, we kind of want to just push God a little. I mean, I mean I, my, my mind went back to, it's not who I'm talking about, but Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarah, Sarai, you know, at that moment. God says, I'm going to make from you a great nation. Your children, you know, will be like, the number, like the the numbers of sand, the grains of sand, and, and you know, and then time goes on. Now they got God's direction, they got God's word, they got God's promise. Even we call it a covenant, even. And as time goes on, they're going, well, maybe, maybe we need to kind of push God's hand a little, because Sarah's not getting pregnant. And so what do they do? Well, Sarah's like, take, take my servant. We'll have children through her. And that didn't cause any problems. <laughs> you know, go back and read that story in Genesis, right? Because they were trying to go, well, wait a minute. Just listen to what God said and just lean on him and trust in him. That's, that's an example. We, but we do that, right? Kind of want to force God's hand sometimes. And when we hear God's word, when we hear God's direction, isn't it, you know, you go, this, you go back to anywhere, you know, anywhere, but in, in the Bible, there are numerous inconceivable but true accounts of how God spoke and how people heard him. For instance, God spoke through a burning bush. Isn't that kind of crazy? Right? With Elijah, that was with Moses. With Elijah, it's a gentle breeze. God spoke numerous times through angels. Abraham, we're just studying Daniel in, in, our, in our class in the last few weeks. Uh, Mary and Joseph, angel, angelic, Gabriel comes. You know, God is bringing his direction, his message, prophets, right? So today's story is in good company. Uh, I'm calling this message, Will the Real Donkey Please Stand Up? because I can't say it the way I really wanted to say it. <laughs> but it's, this is sort of an umbrella of lessons from God's sense of humor. How many agree that God's got a sense of humor? Got to, to put up with us, right? It's all of that, right? So let me, let me set the stage for the story. Uh, first of all, we're going to go back into the book of Numbers. Numbers is the fourth book of the Old Testament. It's part of the first five books, which are the books of Moses, and because it's in numbers, and it's, uh, specifically we're looking at chapter 22, what it means is that Moses from Exodus has already led the people out of Egypt, Israel. And which, if they're in numbers, it means they are now wandering around in the wilderness, in the desert, which they did for 40 years. 
Okay? So we're in that, we, fr we phrase it that way, you know, this, the, 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 the wandering in the wilderness or the wandering in the desert. Uh, but as they're going in this journey that God is leading them on, by the way, they, they have to go 40 years in the wilderness because of their sin. They could have gone directly to the promised land, but there are consequences, earthly consequences to sin, aren't there? Um, and, and as they're wandering in the wilderness, they are encountering conflicts and even wars that are happening with them. But because at that point they're following God and, and, and they're good, man, Israel is just crushing it. Or more accurately, they're crushing anybody who comes up against them. And the word gets around. So the main character in our story today is a man called Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M. Now, the Bible tells us, first off, Balaam is not Jewish. He's not part of the Israeli contingent here, people. But he was highly regarded by some of the kingdoms and nations around him as a prophet, as a soothsayer. And it was thought that you could pay Balaam to come and he could bless or he could curse. He could just do that with his words. And in this story, Israel is approaching the kingdom of Moab. And the king of Moab is afraid, understandably. Because he's heard the stories, you know? He's, he, he's heard the stories of how powerful the Israelites are in battle. And he believes, I'm going to get slaughtered. And so the king summons Balaam. Balaam, come and put a curse on Israel. Wow. That, that's part of the story. The king sends people to Balaam to get him to come with them back to see the king. But this is the message that he has his contingents go to Balaam and say. He says, a people have come out of Egypt and they cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. And I know that who, whomever you bless is blessed. And whoever you curse is cursed. And he's going to pay him for this. Actually, the Bible calls it a, a divination fee. Okay. So ba Balaam actually does something really good here. Because he's heard of God, the God of the Israelites, Yahweh. And he's like, he's familiar. And, and, and so he says, listen, to the king's men that, that came to talk to him, spend the night here. I'm actually going to go and seek out their God's guidance. Good move. Okay. God tells Balaam. So this is now in Numbers, chapter 22, verse 12. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. They're already blessed. You don't get to bless them, right? Don't put a curse on them. They're blessed. Don't go with them. All right, just look at that, that verse for a second. Is there anything that's not clear in there about God's direction? Don't go with them. Don't curse them. Here's why. Pretty clear, right? Now, because of this, Balaam goes back to the officials now and says, listen, the Lord will not allow me to go with you. And so they go back to the king. And the king sends now even more uh, prominent officials, the bigwigs, to go on his behalf. Right? And they go back to Balaam. And this time the king sweetens the pot. Right? The king's message is this. This is now in verse 16 and 17. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me. Understand what that's saying. Don't even let God keep you from coming to me, the God that you pray to. Don't let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. And then in the story, I think this is where this is, is where the revealing moment is. Balaam says, 
God has told me not to come. Spend the night. I'll go back and talk to him. Do you see a heart problem there? Was there anything not clear about what God said? I'm asking that again, right? So I want to pause here. Balaam already asked God, what should, I, what should I do? God already very clearly spoke to him. And what did he say? Don't go with them. Don't do what they want. Here's today's point. Ready? God's direction is not a suggestion. Say that. God's direction is not a suggestion. Turn to somebody near you and go, did you know that God's direction is not a suggestion? Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> All right. One more time. God's direction is not a suggestion. But now you see they came with more money, more opportunity. And Balaam says, I can't go, but stay here while I go back and talk to God. <laughs> and right there, God, I, you know, this is the moment where God is like, this is, it's very, you know, there's some confusing things about this section right here. But God sees Balaam's heart, doesn't he? Is it possible that God knew Balaam wanted the prize money more than he wanted God? Yeah. So God says, all right, Balaam, go with him, but only do what I tell you to do. Balaam says, okay. God's angry that Balaam said, okay. Because he knows his heart. He knows what he really wants, right? Keep it simple. God told Balaam, don't go, don't curse. They're a blessed people. Why are you coming back to me? So go, because I know what you really want. You want the fame and the fortune that's going to come along with cursing Israel, because they're going to give you that. So go, but I'm going to teach you a lesson along the way. Because you need to understand, Balaam, and we need to understand, church, God's direction is not a suggestion. So I want to pick up the story there. We're going to read, I'm just going to read through some verses. They'll be up on the screen for you of what happens next. God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and he had two servants with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road, with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field, and Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Balaam does not see the angel. But you know, animals have these instincts at times. He sees, and he's like, oh, I'm not going on, you know, goes off the road, but Balaam beats the donkey. So then it says, the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed so close to the wall, it crushed Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Poor donkey. And then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the left or the right or the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it just lays down under Balaam. And Balaam was angry and beat the donkey with his staff. Now stop there for a moment. What's about to happen is a Shrek moment. <laughs> okay? You understand what I'm saying there? You know, the donkey was, was he turned in magical creatures, Shrek 1, and, uh, because it talks. And, of course, the donkey won't talk there until something happens, an accident, and the donkey starts yelling and, and, and talking. And it's a surprise to everyone. We have a talking donkey, right? Even Shrek was surprised. That's our Shrek moment. Here it is. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? And I'm not sure what... The, is more of a surprise to me in this story is that you have a doc talking donkey <laughs> or the Balaam just starts having the conversation like this is no big deal, <laughs> right? 
Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand. He doesn't know how prophetic that statement is right there. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, am, am, am I not your own donkey, which you've always ridden to this day? Have, have I ever been in the habit of doing this to you? Well, no. No, he said. And now the Lord opens Balaam's eyes. And he sees the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. <laughs> and he does what everybody else does when they see an angel. Bows low, fell down face first. Right? So the angel of the Lord asks him, same thing the donkey asked, by the way, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. When we know God's direction, and it's clear, and we choose another one, we're being reckless. You hear that? Your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from these me three, these three times, and if he had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now. I would have spared the donkey. You'd be dead. So Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. You know, that's, that's the response. When we don't follow God's direction, that's sin. Now, if you are displeased, I won't continue on. I'm gonna, I'll go back. And the angel of the Lord then said to Balaam, no, go with these men, but you speak only what I tell you, which means you follow my direction. So Balaam went with Balak's official. Uh, Balak is the king of Moab. Balaam, I didn't use his name because Balaam, Balak, we get confused. <laughs> Balaam went with the officials back to the king. Now Balaam in this story does go back with them, that goes with them, and he stands by his conviction, his understanding of God's direction, that he can only do what the Lord tells him to do. And as it turns out in the following chapters, the Lord will not allow Balaam to curse the Israelites. So that does not happen. But there is an eventual battle between Israel and the Midianites, and what it tells us in Numbers is Balaam was killed in that battle because he's actually fighting on the side of the Midianites, not the side of Israel. Yeah. And, and if you wonder maybe about my interpretation of that story, it actually didn't really come from me either in the New Testament. You know, this is why in the Bible, when you do Bible study and you see a verse, you better you know, take the time to find out what else the Bible says about it. Because you know? sometimes the New Testament makes some incredible commentaries on what happened in the Old Testament. And so we have in 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking about false prophets. Okay? Balaam was seen as a prophet, wasn't a prophet of Israel, God, so he's a false prophet. But he's talking, Peter's talking about false prophets right here in the church. People that claim to speak from God, but they don't. People that, that claim to say God is, is this or accepts that, and his word tells us he doesn't. And so Peter's giving us a warning in the church, right? And he's talking about false prophets, and he says here uh, in verse 19, they have left the straight way. The straight way is God's direction, right? They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam the son of Bezer, which is how he is named in the Old Testament. Who, now, here's the thing. Who loved what? Wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, which spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. It's interesting in that first thing. He wandered off. Why? He loved the wages of wickedness. And in his story, it was fame and fortune here. Right? You love that more. 
I was looking at that verse even last night. Um, he restrained the prophet's madness to not follow God's direction in favor of our own is madness. So what's our takeaway here? Well, when God gives direction, it's not a suggestion. God's direction is not a suggestion. God gave Balaam a clear directive. Don't go with them. Don't put a curse on them. They're blessed. Balaam didn't get in trouble because God didn't give good directions. Okay? He got in trouble because he didn't follow them. There wasn't a problem of misunderstanding. There wasn't a problem of misinterpretation. There was a problem with obedience. Because when God says, do it, do it. Don't try to manipulate things to suit what you want. Balaam understood God perfectly. So now when the second time this delegation comes, when he goes back to God, it doesn't tell us what Balaam said to God. Okay, we don't have that. But I have a feeling it was one of those arm-twisting kind of prayers where you act, we act like we're interested in doing the right thing. But in reality, we've already made up our mind about what we're going to do. Okay? One of those prayers you know, we let God in on your plans. You let God in on our plans. Right? And, and we're trying to get God's will to sum up, somehow line up with what we actually really want ourselves. Can I tell you that there's no need to pray when God's directions are clear? God's plan was already perfectly clear. He had not changed his mind. Listen to this verse in the Bible. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Right? You know who said that in the Bible? <laughs> Go to Numbers 23. That's Balaam speaking. No irony there, right? See, when God tells us to do something, he's, he's not looking for our, inter for our interpretation He's really just looking for our obedience. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if the enemy comes to test your resolve when God gives you direction, because Satan is smart. Because if he, if he doesn't succeed at first trying to get you to compromise, he's going to come back and sweeten the deal. He'll try to make you believe that you can have God's way and your way at the same time even though they don't mesh together. Okay. See, when God asks us to do something, he's just looking, he's looking for absolute obedience. If you compromise on God's will, <laughs> don't complain about the final outcome. Right? Because God knows what's best. And he's going to put roadblocks in our way to get our attention. Hopefully it's not an angel with a sword. That's, that's all, you know. But why does he do that? Because he loves us. And his way is what's best for us. He gives us direction. Because he loves us. Every, someone said every command, just go to the Ten Commandments, but every command is God's way of either providing something for you or to protect you from something. Every command because he loves you. It's not, he's, he's not a killjoy, you know, or, or somebody who just wants to, you know, take the fun out of life. It's for our protection or to provide something for us. He gives us direction because he loves us. He's given us the scriptures, which is where most of his direction is going to be found. If you don't read your Bible, don't, don't go, I don't know what God wants, when you know, and, and then you got to go pray about it, and it's like, I've already told you this. I, thou shalt not steal. I don't have to go to God in prayer about that. God, I know you said this, but in this case, in my circumstances, because mine's unique, I'm unique, you know, 
and my circumstances are unique. So maybe God, in my circumstance, I don't have to go to prayer in that. You know? Gave us the scriptures because he loves us. He gives us each other the good counsel because he loves us. He wants what is best for us. But we've got to come to the place where we understand that God's direction is not a suggestion. It's not one of many options, even though we tend to sometimes see it that way. How many, how many here would be honest along with me and admit that there have been times when I have compromised God's will by doing what I want when I knew it was not what God wanted. But we all have. And so we can't be too hard on Balaam, can we? But here's the good news. Good news is that God loves us enough that he never gives up on us. When we choose our, when we choose our own way against God's way, First off, you know you can't hide that from God, right? You may not tell anybody else, but you don't have to tell God. He already knows, right? He knows our hearts. He knows them better than we do. So when we choose our own way, you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes we forfeit the best that God had for us because we've taken a different path. Sometimes we never get that best in that circumstance back because we chose another path. But God still will not give up on us. He keeps giving us his direction until we understand that that is what is best. Folks, God's direction is best. His direction is not a suggestion. It's a gift. So let's, let's just join our hearts together for a few moments. There's, there's a Psalm 139. Yeah, one of my, if not my favorite psalm. Um, one of those verses says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Hmm. Let me just take a moment here. And, and if you have the courage, because that's a courageous prayer. Just pray that prayer right now and just listen for a few moments. God, search me and know my heart. Just basically what we're asking is show me what you see. God, help us to keep asking that question. So, that every, Lord, you know, every one of us here today, when we leave this place, maybe even before we leave this place, we're going to be confronted with following my way or your way. You're going to be tempted, because that's what Satan does. Lord, thank you that you've already told us that there, first off, is not a single temptation that Jesus doesn't understand. But that you, God, will always give us a way out of temptation, an alternative. And Lord, it's just simply, sin is the temptation to just do what we want against what you want. Or to not do what we want, even though you tell us to. Lord, we are confronted with that every single day. May your Holy Spirit, Spirit just in us, remind us. Help us in those moments to hear the words, God's direction is not a suggestion. I'm telling you, but it's because I love you. I want the best for you. I see, I see the potential in you greater than you could ever imagine. Follow my way. Lord, help us to see that. Give us clarity in your direction, in your word for us this morning. And Lord, give us the, the wherewithal by your Holy Spirit, the strength, whatever it takes, to follow 
whatever it is. In Jesus' name, amen.